When I was in architecture school, I had a professor who gave us an exercise on establishing relationships. It was a very simple exercise, but revealed an inherent complexity. Take the two objects that you see on the screen. When they move around, look and gauge for yourself when you think that connection is made. Should they be close together or far apart? How far apart can they be before they lose any connection, or how close can they be before they simply converge into one? And that was the exercise. The answer, of course, is subjective, because there is no obvious connection to these objects. Later on in grad school, I was doing research on developing new methodologies to evaluate non-transportation infrastructure systems. It's a mouthful. But to me, urban infrastructure is all the stuff out there that makes up our daily lives. So it's not just the roads and the bridges and the utility lines. It's the shopping centers and the restaurants, offices, schools, even hospitals and supermarkets. All that stuff can be thought of as systems and services. Think about when you leave the house in the morning. Everything that you encounter, whether it has to do with work or leisure, your daily necessities or quality of life, all that stuff makes up our urban fabric. And I realized how little we really know about the assets our cities have, let alone what impacts they have on each other or collectively for any net benefit. So this got me thinking. Each one of these objects has a presence and an energy. And what's interesting to me is what happens between these objects. How do they impact each other and what dynamics can be revealed? Can we measure any qualitative attributes? And if you had to pick one, how would you choose? What if we have multiple objects? How do you start making sense out of that complexity? So in order to answer these questions, we need a common denominator. And rather than take a blanket approach, my work has largely been to map out these dynamics to see where the, where the opportunities lie and where potential discrepancies are. Right. And this is what I call urban analytics. And it's a different way of thinking. Urban analytics starts with location thinking and is based on urban data. Data that results from modeling the, the spatial effects of our systems and services. Now, these aren't just random objects. These are actually locations of neighborhood and community parks, something you would see like on an Apple or a Google map. Now, park is largely a, a local service. So the closer you are to it, the more benefit you have. But that benefit diminishes with distance. If we take one park, for example, we can think of the services as creating a spatial footprint, meaning that there is a defined area that is served by that one park. To better understand this, imagine what it's like if you throw a stone into a body of water and you get all those ripples and waves until they essentially disappear. Well, if you apply that rippling effect or concept to parks, you get a spatial footprint. If you apply the spatial footprint to all of the parks, you get a new topography a topography of park services. And this is a resource for a lot of new information. So back from our first example, our goal is really to get quantitative, excuse me, to get, um, our goal from the first uh, exercise was to get quantitative information from qualitative relationships. Excuse me, it's quantitative meaning from qualitative relationships. And what this topography does is that it gives us a continuous surface to measure. So while there's not a natural unit of measure like inches or miles, we use a pulse to, con to give these connections dimension. And a pulse is a central tendency that results from modeling these spatial effects. It is a scaled score from 0 to 10, 10 being the highest. It is the first step in any analysis, and it's also extremely effective in comparing places. Now, if we look at the map, this is, as I said, this the topography of park services. Now, cities often boast about how many parks they have, either in sheer numbers or in acreage. Miami-Dade County has about 700 parks, which includes all the municipal parks. That amounts to about 8,500 acres of park. With 2.5 million people, that averages to around 3.4 acres per 1,000. Now, that actually sounds really good, because that floating benchmark is 2.75 acres per 1,000. 
But let's test the accounting using urban analytics. With this map, we can actually calculate how many people live with, close to a park, and that's about 800,000 people, or 33% of the population. While that's not terribly low, it definitely doesn't blow any benchmark out of the water. It also leaves about 66% of the population somewhat underserved. But it's not actually an accounting problem, because if you do the math, the 3.4 per 1,000 stands. It's rather a spatial problem, because when you consider where the parks are in relation to the population, that's really what we're trying to get at and to measure. So on this park, we've randomly put in different pulse points, and this can be done for anywhere on the map. But if you look at Key Biscayne, that has a 10. I mean, that's just smack in the middle of the park, so that has a 10. And if you look at where we are, we are at a 6.5. Now, what we're really trying to measure is where are the parks in relation to the people, and we can test for that, too. If we apply population into the model, the topography will change, and so will the values. And what happens, now this is very subtle, but it's actually very detailed. What happens, in the Grove, you see that the value jumped up to a 9.3. What does that tell us? That tells us that while we do have parks, it's actually very well sized for the population that it is serving. Whereas, you might question, well, why does Key Biscayne all of a sudden drop? Well, because that's actually the other side of the spectrum. Yes, there's a park there, and it's all park, but there aren't the people immediately there to use it. And that's what this measures. So, for fun, we kind of... Fun. Um, <laughs> we kind of... Um, we ran a demographic analysis to really see if, um, you know, to test an assumption, you know, do low-income people really get less services? So this was actually also to test a correlation to see if low-income actually does have less services. That way you don't need to explain parks, you just explain, you know, low-income. Um, so when we ran that correlation, we actually found no discrepancies. So I'm actually happy to tell you that all income levels are equally underserved by parks. So when I started out my research, the idea was, and still is, that cities can be better planned and managed using relevant information. When we started adding demographics and economic indicators and proprietary data, the applications exploded, and we ended up building products for different businesses. We started looking at real estate, where you can create feasibility studies on the fly with great depth to the urban context. Or for sales management, where your territories can now actually be defined by customized topographies and not just lines in the sand. Or in travel, if you're looking for a hotel, but there are certain amenities that you want, and you're going to select your hotel depending on the amenities that are in the area. So if you want, let's say, a park and breakfast places, you can find that hotel better. And for marketing, that's a whole other talk. And then for logistics companies who run on slim margins can actually optimize their operations by overlaying their data and finding new opportunities. So what would you want in a place? What is the right place for you, and how will you find it? Well, if, has anyone moved or planning on moving? As stressful as it can be, it also offers an incredible opportunity to try something new. And there's no such thing as a one-place-fits-all type of formula. And it also depends on where each, uh, each one of us is in our lives. Are we in college? Are we starting out our careers? Do we have families? Are we empty nesters? Are we just enjoying our active adult years? Some of us like cultural activities. Others want the outdoors. Some want secluded areas. Others want city life. There truly is some place for everybody. Sometimes we just need a little bit of help finding it. So let's think about a family. Family of four, two kids, the parents are in their early 40s, they both work, they're well-educated, they send their kids to private schools. They want to find a place that is with people like them. They want to start it with a wish list of things. They know basically what the neighborhoods are, or maybe they're new to the area and they have no idea where to start looking. They want to start with a wish list of things. Their wish list might look something like this. 
And if we factor in all these criteria into the model, we actually get, what was it, the chicken kitchen or the farmer's market or the target? This is not modeled after my life because the gym's in there. Um, so what we get is a customized topography specifically for this family. And this basically highlights those places that best match what that family wants. So if we take the middle of the road here and look at Coral Gables with an 8.8, .8, we kind of see what's going on in that area. And this gives a whole new meaning to location, location, location. Because what we see here is from all those criteria, we see which one of those actually behaves and pulls that area the strongest. So demographics is by far the strongest. Gyms and nice restaurants are also performing quite strongly. But if the other items were important, such as you know, Target and the private schools and the farmers markets, we would have to rerun this model, prioritizing them, and the values will be different. Now, if we consider the use for a young professional just starting out their careers, they too want to live in a place with people like them. Their wish list might look something like this. And if we apply that into the model, we see a different topography. And this area does not serve those young professionals as well as it does for the, for the family. So we're going to widen our search and see what else is available. Downtown in Miami Beach, no surprise. But for anybody who knows Miami, knows that both downtown and Miami Beach are expensive. They're not the most affordable places to live. So if we want to factor rent into the equation and really see where these young professionals can live with their amenities being served, we see that the, gravity, the gravitational pull, excuse me, the center of gravity pulls west and north, so into West Little Havana North. And this gives these people a much larger area to start looking for a place to live. So back to where we started. And I bet you, you don't see these dots like you did before. While this concept might be new to you, I'm constantly looking at these different relationships and connections and mapping these dynamics so that we can have a better understanding of our cities and our services and what's available. So we can create, we can test assumptions, we can create better benchmarks, and we can also find better opportunities. So while you might not be planning the next park or moving, I want you to start thinking about places, not so much in terms of a reference or a point on the map, but of a multitude of connections, supplying new information to make better decisions. Thank you.